Welcome to China Manufacturing Decoded from Sofist, the podcast where we take you through the major news and topics facing importers and manufacturers in China and Asia today. Hello, everybody, and welcome along again to China Manufacturing Decoded. This, of course, is Adrian from the team, but I'm joined by our CEO Renault. And this is our one hundredth episode, so it's quite a celebration today, Renault. Yeah, right. It's it's a big number. It's impressive, actually. <laughs> so、uh, yeah. we're doing something a bit special today. Yeah, yeah, we are normally. And I mentioned this in an email that we sent out to everybody.、Um, and normally, we choose a topic which is helpful, relevant. Sometimes we get guests on who are in the industry and they share some, you know, cool information. But this time we reached out to all of our listeners and asked the question, you know, what what do you want to talk about? What do you want to know about? Do you have any issues or, or or questions that are bugging you that you want answers to from Renault? And so this episode is all about you and. Loads of people got in touch with us, which was great, and people just got in touch to say, "Hey, we enjoy the podcast. That's that's awesome news, and we love that." And、uh, quite a few questions came in as well. So you're going to basically go through a number of the questions and try and、uh, give some really really helpful answers, Reno. Right? Let's try. Let's try. Yes. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, let's get started with、uh, with the first one. I know you've got a few、yeah. to tackle, so yeah, take it away. All right, I got a list. So I'm going to go down the list, you know, one by one. First one about is about a、um, a question from someone who's been in in China and working with Chinese suppliers for for more than twenty years, and he's looking at the geopolitical. Climate and the, the recent、uh, events,、mm. uh, and he's he's asking if、uh, if we should worry at all with you know the the, the fallout from the sanctions around uh, uh, against uh, Russia and the attitude of the Chinese government. You know, should we worry worry about that?、Uh, mm. It seems like nobody's really worried about it.、Uh, what do you think? Well. I think he's absolutely right. I think we should be worried. The speed of the reaction against Moscow has been amazing. You know, the the, the G7、uh, and 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 the EU,、uh, all you know, and and NATO all together, you know, pushing for sanctions and sort of actually pushing Russia out of globalization, sort of, or at least out of globalization with the West has been amazing, and. Beijing has certainly taken notice, and they are quite prudent. They are not saying anything. You know, they're not saying that they support Russia really. However, they also definitely don't say that they support Ukraine, and they just reaffirm their "quote unquote" unlimited、uh, partnership. You know, with with Moscow. So.、Um, Does that mean that China might、um, be targeted by the same sanctions? No, but it seems like they're not really worried, or at least they、um, they are not totally afraid.、Uh, and it just takes one incident,、uh, a bit of a flare up、um, somewhere in the South China Sea, and a little bit of an overreaction, and would be just one step away from.、Uh, You know, trying to push China out of out of globalization, at least with the West,、uh, yeah. That and that would have an enormous impact on on all economies, pretty much、uh, in in the world. I mean, pushing China aside,、uh, sorry, Russia aside, is going to have an impact. You know, inflation and and, and lower growth to an extent, but with China, it would be such a gigantic wave. Uh, of consequences, it's it's kind of unthinkable, you know, to do anything、um, so suddenly. So anyway, let let's let's see how the situation develops. I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't think that's in the cards,、uh, but we、mm-hmm. should yes, we should worry. Any company that that is seriously invested in China should realize that the risk 
and the, the amount of uncertainty is not going down. It's it looks more like it's going up. Um, mm. It looks like there's sort of an alliance of quote unquote the West, and now there's sort of an alliance of uh, Russia, China, and they're trying to pull India into it because India is very tightly related uh, with with Russia. Um, mm. They're not exactly best friends with with Beijing but hey who knows you know let, let's see where all of this goes I think India will definitely just try to remain neutral and that's probably the smart thing to do for them let's see where this goes but we might be in a very different situation in five years yeah it's it's difficult it's difficult to predict what Beijing are thinking isn't it, it always has been because they yeah. don't do things very overtly I mean a lot of my friends in the UK have asked me as the resident China expert, that is, that's, I'm not a China expert, by the way, but they've asked me, you know, well, are China going to mediate here? Are they going to, you know, take a stand against Russia and whatever? <laughs> to be honest, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's really, really hard to say. Uh, my, my view is that China usually don't want to be involved in, you know, territorial disputes because they don't like people dictating about their own territory and things, you know, yeah, within their own borders. So my view is that they would probably say, you know, uh, things should be handled by the people who it's relevant to. And, and are they just going to wade into something like that? Maybe not. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's certainly a difficult time. And there does seem to be more polarization between the East and West, for sure. Yes, yes, definitely. So let's watch for the, the developments. Mm. Another question was about someone who buys medical products, medical devices, and he was asking about his quality control policy. He was asking what inspection level uh, should we use and what, um, and I guess also he was asking about the AQL limits. And well, if you buy, if you buy medical devices, it, it, it really depends uh, because if you buy an expensive class two or class three device, you, you know, where, where uh, for people who are not familiar with that, it means that it's, it, you know, the risks are high. The risk of mm-hmm. impact to, uh, to the patient's health is high. Well, in that case, uh, you don't want to use acceptance sampling at all. You, you want to, um, you want to make sure that manufacturing and testing and everything at the factory is so good that the likelihood of any defective unit being sent to, let's say, to a hospital is extremely low. So, mm. it, you know, acceptance sampling is really um, not the right approach here. So forget about inspection levels and, and AQA limits and everything. Now, medical devices is, is very, very wide. If you look at class one devices, it could be uh, could be eyewear frames, you know, glasses, uh, it could be it could be a number of things, and in in these cases, it's it can get much closer to consumer goods. Uh, if it's a um, you know if it, it's not intrusive, it's it's not it doesn't have to be sterilized, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Very simple product that yeah might get in contact with the skin, but that that's about it. And if it's defective, it doesn't have any um, high risk uh, failure mode, you know, high severity risk. In that case, yeah, you can use acceptance sampling, like, um, you know, as used for many consumer goods. And you, you, you might go with, you know, what, what the acceptance sampling standards tell you, you know, go for uh, normal severity level two. Uh, by default at first you know Mm. and then when it comes to the AQL limits if it's cheap if it's a cheap product and the defects would be pretty easy to to notice and it's very easy to replace a product by another you might even go for uh, 2.5 percent for major and 4.0 for minor right if it's a more expensive product if a failure of the product or a defect on the product might lead to a risk for the for, for the user or the patient, but then you want to be much stricter, and the, the AQL limits might be, for example, zero point sixty five for uh, for major. Uh, really, it's it's hard to give a very um, 
clear answer, you know, without knowing more. Uh, medical devices mm-hmm. is very, very, very wide, very wide. Is anything that that that's used basically for uh, for treating illnesses or preventing even illnesses, you know, uh, without anything that that is not drugs, of course. So I think I'd leave it at that, and then we can get to the next question, which also started as a very general question. You know, someone from. Uh, Benin in West Africa, and who asked how to improve the quality of products from China suppliers. <laughs> and I said, okay, what, what kind of product do you do you buy? And he said, I buy bicycles and office furniture. And the problem I face is the products are not strong and they break. Okay, mm. so if you if you say the product is not strong and it breaks, first it's not. A, uh, exactly, you know, s- strictly speaking, it's not a quality issue. Quality issue meaning that it's because of poor manufacturing, right? This is related to the design of the products. They are designed with poor, um, you know, with a poor choice of components and, and materials. And they're assembled in a way that lets them break too easily. That, that makes them uh, not durable, not reliable. Usually we classify this as a reliability issue. Now, how, how to make sure that you buy products that are reliable? Well, there's two answers to that. Scenario A is that you are the one who designed a new product and then you have it manufactured in China. Well, then the reliability of the products is mostly in your hands. You need to specify materials and components and the manufacturing process uh, in a way that ensures that the products will be reliable, right? So if we take, I don't know, office furniture, for example, there's, I don't know, um, the file cabinet, the drawers and the drawers, you know, there's some kind of sliders. And, and you know, if you, if you pick the right components here that are durable with good bearings and, and so on, it's going to last a very long time. Or, 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 you know, office furniture. Think of these, um, these office chairs that need to be thrown away after six or six months or 12 months because one of the wheels breaks. Mm. It's extremely uh, frustrating. And it's true. I mean, if, if, if I go in China, I go out and I buy a, an office chair for 150 RMB. That's what I'm going to get. Um, <laughs> there's, there's no way around that. Uh, but I kind of know about it. It's a cheap product that would be thrown away very fast, unfortunately, right? So in that case, I'm in scenario B. I go out and I buy a product that already exists. And if, if that's the case, well, you need to look at the product. You need to look at the materials and components it's made from. And you need to assess, okay, is this going to be durable or not? Uh, or as soon as there's going to be a stress a little bit higher is going to it's going to incur, incur some uh, fatigue uh, over a number of you know usage cycles and it's it's going to break after whatever three months or nine months of of normal usage and you you can actually replicate that and the way to replicate that is with reliability testing mm-hmm. you know so for example on on office furniture if you look at the, um, the standards for importing that kind of furniture into the EU, for example, there are compliance standards. And if you look at the compliance standards, they actually say, you know, load whatever, 200 kilo on it for two hours, et cetera, et cetera. A, a good part of compliance of furniture is actually related to reliability. So you can have a lot of ideas this way about how to, how to test for reliability. And there's, companies, including ours, that can put together a custom plan that makes sense for your products. You know, bicycles, same way. There are compliance, there's ISO standard about the safety of bicycles. And if the bicycle passes these safety standards, uh, the safety tests, well, you know, they are somewhat reliable because a lot of, there's a lot of stresses imposed on the, on the products. Uh, as you know, uh, just simply by, by following these ISO standards, right? So office furniture and bicycles are really two product categories where I would say a buyer that 
does his due diligence and tries to do things by the book, can really find some good resources. There's no excuses. It's really about searching for information and using it. It's all out there. There, there are uh, good, smart standards that can be applied. You don't need to be a, uh, uh, an expert in reliability, actually, to, to see how, um, how to test these products, right? For some other product categories, it's very different. But here, it's related to safety, and it, there's already some good standards. So, yeah, in, in, in a nutshell, if you want to stop buying products that break easily, you get to look at these products, get some samples, do some simple testing on your side, arrange for reliability testing if you if you have some doubts, if you want to make sure. Uh, but that's the way, you know. And don't don't go for the, the lowest price, of course, because the lowest price will always come with with cheaper components, you know, mm. most of the time. And that's what um, that's throwaway products that would be disappointing users and will go directly to landfill. Everybody's losing here, right? Including the, the environment, of course. So, um, you know, pay attention to the, the products that you buy, see how they are built and, and think of how they can break and dismantle them and study them and maybe may get, get a mechanical engineer or an industrial engineer to, to look at them and give you some comments you know, a part of it is, is relatively straightforward, I would say. So you can get those samples from your Chinese supplier and have them mm-hmm. sent to, you know, the, the testing mm-hmm. lab or the testing company within China and get all the testing oh, sure. done and, and get the advice before you've even placed an order. Correct. Yes, correct. Mm. Yes. Uh, but even if you get sent some samples, you can start the analysis. Uh, if you get a little bit of a sense of, uh, you know, material science and product assembly, and, and if you yourself are, you know, think of it as a user and you think of all the repetitive motions and the stresses, you know, the, the weight and the shocks and so on, you, you're going to find some weaknesses in the design of the product. If mm. it's a cheap product that, you know, as I say, is a, is a throwaway product. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that's that's great advice. I think many buyers listening, they'll be thinking, yep, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's not, it's not just about quality. Uh, it's, no. it's, it's about the, the, the design of the product and what components were picked and how they were specified mm. and so on. Mm. All right. Another reader who responded and he asked, huh, so he asked two questions. I'm going to Try to go through them without spending uh, an hour on each, but mm-hmm. these are very wide questions. So I'm sorry in advance if uh, if I'm not specific enough because I don't know the context. So first one is any tactics to deal with volatile costs these days? Well, it depends where these volatile costs come from. You know, if if you look at the the RMB exchange rate against the US dollar over the past few years, it has tended to go up a bit. You know, uh, I mean, especially if you look at the, the past year, but there's no real way to, to compensate for that. Now, what might happen is that if you ask your suppliers to quote you in dollars, they might expect that by the time they get paid, the RMB will be stronger and the US dollar will be weaker. So they w- they might you know, they might add another 2 or 3% just to cover that risk. If you do not think that's a risk, then you should get quotes in RMB. And then you can still say it would be paid in US dollar, but we agree on the quote in RMB. And it removes the, the risk for the supplier of, um, of seeing the RMB get, get stronger, right? Mm because then they will still get the same number of RMB no matter what. That's, that's the idea. Uh, that's a simple, simple approach. Or you can even get an account in RMB maybe. If you can ask your bank and then you can wire RMB to, to your Chinese supplier. More and more buyers have been doing that. Okay. Mm. Um, the volatile costs, well, most probably you're talking about material costs that 
obviously push up the prices of the of the products so that that one is tough so first if the supplier tells you hey the cost of you know whatever aluminum is going up and there's a lot of aluminum in your products first you want to make sure okay is that correct or not and aluminum is a relatively simple product to track because it's it's um uh, there's an international price i think it's in the in the it's traded in chicago if if the price goes down in chicago your chinese supplier says it goes up it's not impossible but you can kind of challenge them a bit but the best is to get a price indication in in china you know for that specific grade of alloy or, or whatever and we've been tracking some of the most common material costs uh, at mm-hmm. feast for what for about one year now just because it's so um, so helpful to some of our clients and that comes from a, an expensive database uh, maintained in, uh, by a chinese company and, and and obviously there's a lot of commodities we don't we don't pull out you know all of them just a few of them but by getting the 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 actual prices in china you can see you know hey maybe aluminum has been yeah getting a little bit higher in the past months but if you look at the past three months it's only up three percent or five percent you know so then you can get back to your supplier and say hey we agreed on the prices 18 months ago and if you look at the prices it's you know it's only you know x percent higher or maybe it's, it's pretty much the same why do you push the price of the product up now right <laughs> in some cases it can be um it can be pretty a pretty good response and then the supplier doesn't really know what to, what what to say but for that you need to have some data and show them that you have the data about the prices in china another another way of course is to redesign the product well maybe you can you can use less aluminum in your product maybe you can uh, change to another kind of uh, material or maybe you 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 have to accept that that specific product is going to be more expensive but you might develop a new product that uses cheaper materials and that will be sold at the price that the previous product was sold at. You might keep you know, both of them on the shelves, so to speak, at the same time. Sort of, you know, you go to an Apple store and yeah, you're still going to see the, the 12 and the XS or whatever they call mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And they have several versions of it, right? At different price points. Well, same thing, I think. More and more customers are used to seeing that. So you, you you can have several versions of the same product at different price points with different different materials, different ease of assembly and so on with, with, with clearly different pricing, right? Some, sometimes, yeah, you need to redesign your product to develop a new product. Volatile costs, to get back to the question, well, is it, does it have to do with electronic components? That one, again, if you do not redesign your product, uh, that's really a tough one, a very, very tough one. Uh, a lot of projects of uh, development of new products are on hold. And a lot of productions, actually, of developed products are on hold because some of these electronic components, the, the price went from, uh, whatever, you know, 20 cents to, to $30. I mean, no, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but but the, the, the increases in prices have been spectacular. Plus, the the lead times to to get them are very long, and a lot of people you know are very frustrated and they have to buy it on the open market in, in in Shenzhen or in Hong Kong, and they never really know for sure you know is it a genuine part or or a fake part, and even if it's genuine, what you know. What, what's going on, you know, how long ago was it made and how has it been um, kept, uh, you know, out of humidity and, and, and so on? You know, is it still going to be as good as, as the good one? <laughs> mm. I mean, as the new ones, but people are taking risks. Uh, it's not an issue of higher costs here. It's, it's also an issue of, of higher quality risks and reliability risks. And people might, if they don't do the proper testing, they might find out about that uh, six months down the road when it's very, very expensive to have failures. So we could 
talk and talk and talk about that, but without knowing exactly what these costs are, it's it's a little bit difficult to um to go more in depth. Hmm. The second question was how to work with Chinese suppliers without being ripped off. Ah, well, I would say hey, make sure that they don't they don't see you as a as a newbie. That that is actually very very important. Uh, make sure that they see you as a long-term uh, established customer, not a customer that is, you know, unreasonable, that doesn't seem to have a good business plan in place, that uh, might disappear at any time, that keeps uh, referring to competition and seems to be eager to jump over to another supplier. You know, all of these are actually going to make your supplier more nervous. Um, you know, your supplier might put you in the category of the clients that we don't really care about, right? And that, that's where they, they might misbehave a bit. Also, obviously, selecting the right kind of supplier is extremely important. You don't want to work with a supplier that has only been in business for one year, that doesn't have a proper website or, or anything that looks like it's really trying to be established in the business, uh, that, that screams high risk. Uh, however, if you see a supplier has been in business for, for years and uh, they can send you some, some information, for example, some audit reports uh, from some of their customers, they, they can talk intelligently about your product, about your industry, about compliance standards, and so on. You know, you 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 will be in much safe, much better hands. You know, your project will be in much better hands. You will run a lower risk of being ripped off. Then, okay, these are sort of the basics, right? Don't go and work with companies that might be a scammer, or or don't sh- don't um, don't do things that make them think you are not a good customer. This is very basic, but if you do that already, your risk goes down quite a bit. Then try to avoid any payment terms that don't seem normal. If they ask for more than 30% upfront, that's not very good. Try to get them to sign a manufacturing agreement that... um, let us say, um, that is enforceable in China, um, if they are a Chinese company anyway, uh, or in, in their country, so that you can actually hire a lawyer and go after them if they stop responding and, you know, and have a bunch of your money, for example. And I'm not even covering you know, the case where you are developing a new product with them. That's you know, even more complicated Basically, you need to do a lot of due diligence, but also you, you need to have the right kind of um, agreements. And we, we spoke about that earlier. There's a previous podcast episode. And yeah, I guess, I guess I'll guess leave it at that because it's um, mm. we, we could talk for hours about these topics, but uh, eh, w- without knowing the exact situation of, of, sure. of the person who wrote that, it's a little bit difficult. But, but related related to all of that that you've just spoken about, about avoiding being, you know, taken advantage of, we've done a number of different podcast episodes about building a good relationship with suppliers. Right. Of course, there's all the stuff we've done about IP protection and numerous blog posts. Actually, you only wrote about uh, manufacturing contracts and, you know, some of the fears on, on each party's side just... Just yesterday, uh, yesterday being the 30th of March, so that's a very new blog post on mm-hmm. Sophie's. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, all of this stuff we'll link to as well, of course. All right. Do we still have time for uh, another question? Perhaps we, we squeeze one more in. All right. Okay, then this is another reader who gave us six questions. <laughs> Actually, so I'm not going to go through all of them. We can keep some of them for later. Number one is how, yeah, how to work with Chinese suppliers that I don't know personally without being ripped off. Well, it's funny because it's the same um, kind of question that, that I just responded to. Yeah, I would say you don't know them personally. It doesn't really matter that much. You know, you get to 
to follow uh, good good due diligence, good business practices, uh, and 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 so on, as I mentioned before. Uh, and I'll cover the second question, and then we'll mm-hmm. keep the others for um, future episodes. Mm-hmm. So the second question is, how can I make sure of the quality of the product ordered if I'm not in China to supervise myself? Okay, this one we need to break it down a little bit. First, the quality of the product ordered. Is the design actually durable and reliable? You know, to go back to the earlier question about the, the bicycle and the office equipment mm. uh, that, that breaks too easily. And um, that's part of what people call a uh, bad quality product, right? So, the, the, you know, I already responded on, on that, uh, that point, right? It's possible to test the, you know, some samples and confirm that they will not break easily. Uh, that the design actually is sound and that doesn't come with uh, glaring weaknesses that will lead to early failure of the product. Then, how to make sure that it's manufactured properly? So, again, we need to break it down. First, before you give the order, you need to make sure that they have the capability to manufacture it as you request. And that usually means auditing the factory, making sure, you know, do they have these processes in-house? What about their process controls? What about their, um, their, their quality system? So this will give you an indication of the, the risk of giving that kind of production to this factory. Then if you say, okay, we confirm, let's go ahead. You need to make sure that they don't subcontract, right? You need to make sure that the factory that they showed to you or to your auditor is actually the factory that will make the the product. And we've mm-hmm. seen so many cases of subcontracting, you know, without telling the buyer, even though the buyer had visited a certain factory and, you know, and said, yeah, this is where we're going to make your order. And then in the end, that's not the case, just because maybe the, the factory is very busy or maybe it's some kind of trading company and they went for lower costs. Now, as I mentioned just a little bit before, you can have the factory sign a manufacturing agreement. And part of that manufacturing agreement is to to set some penalties in case production doesn't take place at the the appointed factory, the factory that's authorized for production of your product. Now, the next point is the right factory is going to make the production of your product. Great. Are uh, they going to buy components that are up to the quality standard? You know, because bad components will lead to bad product. I mean, there's no way around that, right? It's garbage in, garbage out. So if it's a large production, you might want to send an inspector there as you mentioned, you will not be in China. Okay. And that's the case of pretty much all foreign buyers at this point in time. You cannot get into China easily. Well, there's a number of uh, companies such as ours and a lot of others that have inspectors on the ground and can do product inspections on your behalf, right? So it's possible to do an, an inspection of the components when they arrive at the factory before assembly uh, starts. Uh, sometimes maybe the first process is to do cutting, you know, I don't know, for, for textile or for uh, cables, or there's a number of things where, where they will start to cut and then they will, they will do some work and then they will assemble the product, etc. In that case, it might be just before they start cutting. Uh, if it's not a large order, you might hold off and then wait until the first finished products come off the line. And that's the case where, you know, you, you have someone, again, you, you, you appoint an inspector to go to the factory, you check the first finished product. And if there are issues, it's like uh, <laughs> raising the red flag, right? You tell the, the people in production, hey, did you see that? Uh, this is not as per the, the requirements of the, of the, of the buyer. Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and the inspector will tell you, and then you have to communicate to the supplier to tell them, 
you know, to confirm if it's acceptable or not, and to get them to take uh, corrections, you know, to implement corrections immediately. If it's not a big order, if it's a relatively small order, then you can, again, you can hold off a bit and send an inspector later for a final random inspection where everything is uh, completed, pretty much everything is packed, and the inspector comes in, pulls some cartons at random, puts some pieces at random from the cartons, and really checks what is the average quality level, right, of the, the whole production. And that's the only, the only time in the production process where that's possible. Uh, they can also check the packing, the labeling. I mean, the, the full product as it's going to be shipped out, right? Mm. That's the most common type of product inspection. Again, there's a lot of companies on the ground in China that can help you with that. And you should basically send your, your information to, to one of them and ask how they would go about checking your product. You know, how many samples would be checked and what's the price? If you let the supplier ship the products to you, well, that, that is a big problem. In case there are quality issues, how do you get back to them, right? That, that is really very, very, um, very high risk. So mm. Just one topic that I forget. Of course, you also need to have an idea about your standard. Make sure your, your, your supplier knows what you can accept and cannot accept, at least covering the big, some big mistakes that you can think of or maybe that you suffered in the past. This is, um, this is something you, you really, really want to, to communicate to your supplier because when that kind of problem comes up in production and either an inspector or maybe yourself, once the products have been delivered in your country, once you find that kind of problem, you get back to your supplier, they will have zero excuse right? Otherwise, they're going to say, oh, well, you know, other customers in your, in your country, they accept this. Usually they know that for that kind of price level, they have to deal with that, blah, 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 blah. And this, of course, is infuriating to, 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 to buyers, but it's not such a bad excuse, actually. <laughs> it's not it's not easy for the buyer to just uh, get it out of the way. So try to make a list of the issues you really don't want to see and make sure that the supplier is aware of that and confirms that. Then they have no excuse when that kind of pro problem uh, comes up. Mm, wise words there. Uh, I like it. And yeah, the expectations, they've just got to be set, haven't they? You know, you can't go into a relationship with the supplier and not tell them what you're expecting and then if there are issues be able to not punish them be able to complain and to and to get retribution because how are they supposed to know yeah 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 right right yeah a lot of people go to china or vietnam or india and think oh the manufacturers they know everything they've been in this business for a long time they know the product much better than i do yeah maybe but they don't know what your market would accept or not accept you have to tell them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it's not uncommon, right? It's you know we're we're, we're sort of smiling here, but actually Every this day. is not an uncommon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yes. mm. Okay. Great. Well, th those are some cracking questions. I've loved this episode, and and uh, and it was really great to hear from you know a number of our, our listeners, and uh, hopefully your answers have uh, really helped the people that ask the questions and and otherwise as well. So that concludes the hundredth episode. So that's kind of like two years worth of of uh, China manufacturing decoded that we've been doing. Right. 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 Yeah. Basically, since COVID hit. Uh, we've been trying to keep that alive and, and, and develop this podcast, yes. And if people have other questions, they should just send us an email or, you know, uh, or find us in, in some way, yeah, in some yeah. social media and uh, send, send us a message. Yeah, go through the contact page on sophies.com as well. That's always a good way. But but yeah, uh, open to any kind of questions or, or emails. So absolutely send them in. Yeah. Great. Well, normal service will be resumed next week when we'll be back on to selecting topics. And yeah, some of the questions that we didn't quite get to today, you're going to expand on those in, in future episodes. So we'll be looking forward to those as well. All right. Thanks, Adrian. And thanks, everybody. 
Thanks again for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Sophies Group. We're on a mission to provide you with everything you need to manufacture effectively in Asia, including inspections, auditing, new product development support, contract manufacturing, 3PL warehousing and fulfillment, and much, much more across Asia's key manufacturing areas. Visit us at sofeast.com, that's S-O-F-E-A-S-T dot com, to learn more and get help. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please do rate, review and share because it will really help others discover us too.